Survival Minecraft is incredibly fun, but can be difficult, so in this video I'll show you how to do everything from starting your world to getting elytra. Immediately when you spawn into a world, you want to analyze your surroundings and see what's there, and as soon as you've done that, you want to collect a minimum of three logs. Turn them all into planks, make a crafting table, and then place that crafting table down and make two batches of sticks. Make with two of those sticks a wooden pickaxe, but no other wooden tools as they're just a waste. Then dig straight down with your wooden pickaxe. Once you meet stone, simply mine three pieces of that stone. With those three cobblestones, simply put them in the crafting table to make a stone pickaxe. Then go back down here with your stone pickaxe, and you want to mine out a bit more stone. Generally, you want enough for all your tools and two furnaces, but if you see some iron nearby, you can just get enough for one furnace and a stone pickaxe. But I didn't see any easy iron nearby, so I'm just going to mine out about 32 cobblestone. Then exit back out, make some more sticks, and let's start making our tool set. And finish off by making one or two furnaces. Now collect up your crafting table, and it's on to initial resource collection. At this stage, we simply want to walk around and try and locate anything that could be useful. Also, now that you have your stone axe, just go up to a couple more trees and get yourself a few more logs, as they'll be very useful in the continuing steps. Perfect. All we have to do now is go get some food. And here we have a good source of that. Also, before you kill every single animal next to the spawn point, something you do want to be aware of is if you're planning on living near here and making a bunch of mob farms, just to leave two of every single mob type unharmed so you can really easily get those later on. We have a decent amount of food now, but it's really important that we now get a bed. And there's two ways of getting it. The first one is trying to find three sheep, killing them for their wool, taking that wool and of course crafting it into a bed. But the second one is something that we very luckily found in this world, and that's what's right in front of us, a village. Villages are really common in Minecraft, so it's quite frequent to have one right in front of you when you first get into the world. But be sure before you go rushing off too much to get your food to start cooking. And of course, if you haven't found any coal yet, you can always just use planks. And a really great idea is to actually start off by using your first wooden pickaxe, as it can smelt one item for free. And we've now acquired our bed through the village method. But now that we can skip the night, as well as having a decent food source, it's on to the next stage and that one is my personal favorite, exploration. There are many things that we should be looking out for as we go around this Minecraft world, as they're going to help us later on in the run. Some big ones are if you see any endermen, be sure to kill them for ender pearls. And of course you can very easily do that by going into a two block tall area and then just hitting them a few times with an axe or a sword. As soon as you get a decent supply of logs, you definitely want to craft a couple boats because these can save your life in a bunch of different ways. Also if while caving you have to see any hostile mobs, you definitely want to get a good supply of arrows from skeletons. Try to successfully kill as many creepers as you can by hitting them and then getting out of their explosion radius, as gunpowder is also really important later on. Alright, we're going to pick up all of our items now and start exploring. We were lucky enough to instantly find a village next to the spawn point, but generally you want to explore around and find one. You definitely want to have all of your important items on you at all times, as at this point you wouldn't have a base. Some things you especially you want to look out for when exploring is some villages next to your spawn point, but another big thing is any large cave entrances. That's because those can give you a super good route to iron, coal, lapis, and even diamonds. If you do happen to find a village, some really important things to look out for is the blacksmith house that could be in any village type, as of course there you can get diamonds and other great loot. But also if there's hay bales, melons, or any other food just laying around, these can give you a super amazing long-term food source, which can help you not have to make a food farm super early. And lots of villager houses have loot chests in them, and it's always worthwhile to take a look in there and grab out some of the things you find. And make sure to trap two villagers inside the village so that they will not die from zombies later on. This is really important, especially if your village is near spawn. As you're exploring around, make sure to grab a little bit of sugar cane if you see it, since you're going to need to get exactly one book before long. And if you happen to pass by any forests, be sure to chop down a couple stacks of logs, because these are going to be super super important when you go caving. It can be really useful when going around to set up your hotbar like this, with your sword first, then two pickaxes, an axe, a shovel, and a hoe. Then you have easy access to all these different tools whenever you need them. Something really important that you want to get in your world is some bamboo, so you can either get this by finding it inside of a jungle or a bamboo jungle biome, and if you're nowhere near a jungle, try looking in the ocean, because a massive amount of shipwreck chests will have a couple bamboo in there, so you can easily farm yourself a large supply 
supply from just those few ones in the shipwreck chest. But in this world we have a bamboo jungle, so we're gonna collect a good amount of that. The world spawn of your Minecraft world can be in so many different biomes. If you're in a desert, grab the extra sugar cane on the water, and be sure to collect some sand, as it'll help you later on when you're exploring the nether. If you're in a plains biome, kill as many food animals as possible, sparing just one or two of them if you want to breed them up later. And if you're in an ocean or river, be sure to kill the fish near there for food, and maybe look in any nearby shipwreck or ocean ruins chests to get some extra loot. If you're in a heavily forested biome, like let's say a dark forest or a jungle, you can speed yourself up and make your travel a lot less dangerous by going on top of trees, and you can spiral up them to collect the logs. Or of course, if you're close by any valuable structures, like let's say a desert temple, be sure to raid them first so you can skip a few steps. Now we've explored our world quite a bit, and we're to the next step, which is upgrades and caving. If you've traveled along and seen any coal or iron, be sure to mine that. But of course at this stage, your focus can now change to only try and get yourself through all the stages of progression. Now iron is really important, and there's two places you can find it. The tallest mountains possible, or around Y16, which is a little bit above where the stone layer turns into deep slate. We have some mountains here, so we're going to travel up them and grab the iron that exposed. If you're about to venture down into a deep and dark cave, be sure to mine a decent amount of coal before you go down there, as since Minecraft 1.18, there really isn't a good source of coal super far underground. Running out of torches is a bad idea, so to prevent that, grab yourself maybe half a stack to a stack of coal before you head down. Also important to make sure you've collected a large amount of logs, as there's not usually a very good wood source underground unless you're near an abandoned mine shaft. Collecting iron inside of Minecraft can take a long time, so just be sure that you're not grabbing too much when of course you could find it much more efficiently later on. You need 24 iron for a full set of iron armor, 5 for the helmet, 8 for the chest plate, 7 for the leggings, and 4 for the boots. You also need 14 iron for your full tool set. And of course that's 1 for the shovel, 3 for the pickaxe, 3 for the axe, 2 for the sword, 2 for the hoe, but you really do need 4 more, 3 of those for a bucket, and 1 for a shield. So make sure to not stop grabbing iron until you have at least 42. If you're having trouble finding iron, any of the tall mountain biomes, like for instance the stony peaks, or maybe even the jagged peaks, will almost always have massive amounts of it exposed. As soon as you get even a few pieces of iron, you want to start smelting them. And that's because the second you get that first iron ingot, the best idea is to craft it into a shield. A lot of players won't use shields, but it is probably the best method to stop taking damage in the entire game. Your second priority should always be an iron pickaxe, and after that a bucket. In fact, now that I have this bucket, I'm going to instantly go and pick up some water with it, because then we have this great method of basically stopping our fall damage by placing down the water before we hit the ground. Now you can always throw away your old stone tools when you get enough iron for iron ones, or you can keep them, but a big issue at this point is going to be inventory management, so it's always important to make sure you don't have too many things clogging your inventory, and a double set of tools will definitely do that. Now for this particular world, because I was able to get all these hay bales so early on from that village, I'm not going to make an iron hoe because I don't have an immediate need for getting a food source. But I haven't yet found all 42 iron I need, so I'm going to make about half a stack of torches then go underground and start mining. The biggest trick to mining is having at least two iron pickaxes, also a good source of food in your inventory, and with a shield in your offhand so you can block attacks as well as exploring and lighting up a cave. Just be careful when you're exploring underground not to go too far, because there are a lot of hostile mobs that spawn into the game, and you can really easily die under here and lose all your progress so far. And always make sure to stay on top of your eating, as one of the biggest sources of death is by not eating enough and then not regenerating your health when you get hurt. Well now we're finally going to have enough iron for all of our tools, but we're running into a small problem. We don't really have enough inventory room now, in fact our inventory is entirely full, but we want to go down in the mines and try and find some diamonds. And that's why we're going to have to take a small break in our progression chain and go on to the next step, and that is making a base. Now all you have to make at this stage is a starter base, but still a place to safely hold all of your items is very important. The first step is always to make yourself at least 
least four chests. Why four? Well, the reason is that usually four chests is just enough to hold all of your items and also sort them a bit, without almost instantly running out of room. And of course, now we can take all these items from our inventory and place them in the chest if we do not immediately need them. Now, a starter base's location in Minecraft should be centered around a few useful areas. For instance, here we have a cave right beneath us, there is a jungle to this side, and there is an ocean to that side, and so then we have easy access to a lot of different resources, and also some places where we could potentially build. But ideally centering it around something like let's say a village or some other structure, maybe a ruined portal, woodland mansion, or some other generated structure that's going to give you a bit of a leg up is often the best idea. A starter base serves a couple different locations. The first is a secure place to store your items, but as well as that you need a dedicated respawn point, so if you die you'll actually go back there, and that's why at this point you want to craft a second bed. Now hopefully you have the materials for a second bed, but if not I would highly suggest going out and getting those. And the reason why is that then you can set your spawn point at this bed, go out and do whatever you want. And with your second bed, if it ends up being night, you can set your spawn point there. But let's say you don't and you die, you'll still have a home to generate back to instead of going all the way to the world spawn, which you're probably not anywhere near, but as well as that, then you have mobility, but also some security to spawn right next to your items again. And although we don't have these at this point, some other things that are likely going to appear around your starter base is a area for brewing, enchanting, and smelting, as well as being sort of the center of all the different things you do. So for instance, your farms, strip mines, and nether portal will all be very near to your starter base. So just be sure to have all these things in mind when you're first building it. And of course, to actually construct your starter base, I would suggest doing it fully out of logs and planks, because planks are technically easier to get than dirt, as the amount of time it takes to punch a log and then craft that into four planks is a lot less than it is to punch four pieces of dirt. And of course, planks look quite a bit better. Also, depending on your location, the most optimal starter base will be a bit different. So in this location, my best choice is actually Actually not to make a base outside here, but rather to make a base inside of this cave entrance. Make it functional, but not to spend too much time making it look super nice, as of course being a starter base you're likely not going to be here for very long. Also if you don't have a lot of wood, turning some of your planks into slabs can definitely make them last a lot longer. Something really important as well to be aware of when you're planning out your base, make sure to not place in the two doors like this, because that'll make it so that zombies can break the doors as they do that in hard mode. Instead place them like this, sort of facing away from the side where you want the doors to be. Then when you close them, they'll still be in the right position, but to the zombies this is closed and this is open, so they won't know to break down these doors because they can think they'll go right through them, whereas in this position they will try and break them down. It's up to you now what you do at this point. There's a couple things you could do, so for instance making a crop farm, maybe an animal farm or some manual farms, but if you want to get to the end of the game sooner and you already have a decent amount amount of food. For instance, here we have tons of hay bales, so we're doing quite good. You can skip those steps and go right on to diamond mining. But if you do want to build these things, a couple pointers are as if you're making a crop farm, make sure to use potatoes and wheat in an alternating row design. This will make them grow about two times as quickly. The reason for the wheat is that then you can breed chickens as well as sheep and cows if you have a mob farm. And the reason for the potatoes is they're the best food source that can be grown easily. And to get potatoes, zombies will sometimes drop one, or you might find them planted down in a village or in some village chests. And of course for wheat, if you bone meal the ground and break that grass, you'll get some seeds. An animal farm is not incredibly necessary, but if you want to build one, here's a couple things you need to know. The only real animals that are worth farming at this point are more or less sheep and cows. As with both chickens and pigs, pigs are just not as good as cows in terms of what you get out of them, as pork and beef are the exact same food value, but you have the added benefit of leather if you have cows. Although of course it's up to you. And if you want to build any other small scale farms at this stage, I would suggest building a micro farm. I have some different videos on this showing you how to build all kinds of different micro farms which are definitely able to be built at this stage in the game. So I'll make sure to have a link to that if you wanted to check them out. But anyway on to diamond mining. Now before we run off into the caves there's a couple things we need. First I would always suggest having at least two iron pickaxes. Also make sure to bring basically all the coal you have and potentially craft a furnace to bring down with you. Also bring at least half a stack of logs as these can be really useful for crafting things but also getting the sticks to make that diamond pick. Finally, a 
water bucket and a boat can always be helpful. A boat if you have to trap a mob that's trying to get you, and a water bucket to go different places or to harden obsidian. We're now going to craft a whole bunch of torches, but make sure to leave some coal as you can use this to smelt things later on. Also, if you want to know a lot more about mining and Minecraft and the best location to find every single ore material and other generated things underground, be sure to check out my Ultimate Minecraft Mining Guide, and I'll have a link down below. One other last thing you want to make sure to have is a decent supply of food, as believe it or not one of the things you may run out of the quickest underground when caving is actually your food source, so to avoid unnecessary trips back up just craft yourself some bread, or whatever other food you have easy access to. Now the big question when mining diamonds is should you strip mine for them or should you cave for them? There are a couple other methods but none of them are super viable if you're early game, and I would say it totally depends on what situation you're in. If you're near a giant cave, definitely going down there to look for diamonds can often be the fastest way to find them, but if you're not in that situation, strip mining is an objectively safer method, although one that also may not give you results as quickly, but I'd always recommend going into a big cave if you can, as of course even if you don't find any diamonds there, you could always from the bottom of it start a strip mine. Just be aware of all the hostile mobs and here's a few tricks when fighting them. Make sure to jump and hit the mob on the way down, as this will give you a critical hit that'll have there be much more damage to that mob. To remember that shields can block damage from basically any mob, making them incredibly useful. Ever since Minecraft 1.18, unless the light level is literally zero, then mobs cannot spawn there, and so because of that even very dim areas are still spawn proofed. Just be sure to light up the caves as you go as it's really important, but something you should do is if you run into a creeper or skeletons to try and kill them. Because as I was saying earlier, getting a good supply of gunpowder as you play the game is a really good idea. Also collecting a small amount of string can be really nice as well. But be careful for mob ambushes and sometimes getting them to fight each other is the most hilarious solution even if they kill each other at the exact same time. But we've actually already found diamonds inside this cave. However, just be aware hostile mobs will definitely try and sneak up on you when you're caving, but also that the size of diamond doors in caves are usually smaller than those found in strip mines, so oftentimes exposed diamonds in caves are unfortunately just one or two of them. And of course the lower down you go, the easier it is to find diamonds, as the rate of them generating is much higher. But here we found another diamond vein that has two diamonds in it, so we now have four. The big question is, how many diamonds should you go for? A lot of players will say 5, and although that is a good number, 7 may actually be better. The reason why is this. You want to have at least 3 diamonds for a pickaxe. You also want 2 for an enchanting table. But something I've found is really vital when in the nether is a diamond sword. And so because of that, having those 2 extra diamonds to make yourself a diamond sword can definitely be very useful. But let's say you haven't found enough diamonds through caving, you want to get them through strip mining. This is all you have to do. Simply mine down in sort of a staircase like this. Also another method if you don't like the staircase is to actually mine straight down. Just simply break the blocks like this so you're always between two different blocks. This way mining straight down is never really dangerous. And you want to go down until you're at Y level, negative 58. The reason why is that this is the lowest place you can go where your diamonds are not being frequently interrupted by bedrock. And generally of course strip mines are safe so you can simply exchange your shield for torches and go on your way. At this stage of the game there's not too much of a point of making an organized strip mine, but if you do want to do that, basically make one long tunnel, and then make side tunnels going off of that every two blocks apart like this, but sometimes five blocks apart will give you a higher chance for diamonds, as in they're not as close to each other so they're not all covering the same area. And this is definitely a part of the game that requires some patience, as with strip mining it can unfortunately take up to an entire half hour to find some diamonds. Just be careful if you mine into lava to block that up quickly, as you can definitely die and lose all your items that way. But I'm not getting very lucky in that strip mine, so I'm going to go back up into this massive cave, which is definitely a better candidate for diamonds if you happen to have these right at your doorstep. And because this is such an amazing cave, we just found another piece of diamond in the floor here. So we're going to mine that, and that'll now give us five diamonds, which is technically enough, but behind the wall here there looks like there's one more. So we'll mine that diamond as well, which gives us six. It's always a good idea to mine around the diamonds you find just a little bit, as the chance for finding sort of parallel diamonds that are there is very likely. And right on the roof here, there's one more diamond. Oftentimes caves aren't this lucky, so it's always good if you don't find diamonds fairly quickly inside of a cave, 
to try out the strip mine method. And although something like, let's say, redstone is not that useful at this stage, definitely grab any gold or lapis that you find. And the reason why is that both these things are very useful later on when we're in the nether and also fighting the ender dragon. We're now going to collect the next big thing we need to progress, and to get that we're simply going to make a diamond pickaxe. Then with our water bucket, turn some of this lava into obsidian, but we're not going to pick up that water bucket, instead keep it there for safety. We're also going to make sure that there's no areas that are not lit up around us, as we could very easily have a mob come over here and hit us into the lava, or even just stop us from mining that piece of obsidian. You want to turn all the nearby lava into obsidian, to make sure that you do not mine a piece of obsidian, and then that goes into the lava and gets burnt up. So that's definitely quite an annoying thing, and I've had that happen quite a bit. Now simply start mining your obsidian. Now there's a couple things you need to know. You need 10 obsidian for the nether portal and 4 for an enchanting table. So between that, make sure to mine up 14 pieces of obsidian. Now we're going to exit our mine and start using that obsidian. And I just randomly found some diamonds there. But oftentimes you'll find them underneath the cave floor. Because of this air exposure rule, generally you'll find more diamonds if you go a little bit lower down. But anyway, finish up your mining trip, grabbing all the things you find along the way. As basically the more of these you have at this stage, the easier this world will become. Also, any gold you mine will be very useful for piglin trading later on. Be sure to start smelting anything you found while caving, and now it's on to using this 14 obsidian. First we'll make the nether portal, and we already have some flint. But if you don't, simply get some gravel, place it down, break it a few times, and there's a 1 in 10 chance you'll get a piece of flint from that gravel instead of it dropping as gravel. You'll also want 4 generic blocks to have as the corners of this portal. Now we're going to basically go outside here, just a little bit away from our base, and be careful if you're caving during the night, as sometimes there'll be mobs there, just like the creeper, which is camouflaged very well in the jungle here, that will be waiting to try and kill you, and may even blow up like this one just did. We may as well place our nether portal there, so simply start by placing down two pieces of obsidian, then having your corners, and of course three obsidian on each side, then the two upper pieces, two more obsidian, go back down, light it, and there is our first nether portal. Portal. With the other four obsidian, we're going to make an enchanting table, but it seems like we don't have any leather, so we're going to try and find a cow, and it looks like there's one right in front of us. A good trick, actually, if you want cooked food from animals instead of it being raw, is to simply kill them by lighting them on fire, then hitting them and making them die while they're burning, and the food they'll drop will actually be cooked. Like, for instance, this cow here, it dropped cooked steak instead of raw beef. It's crazy, actually, that one trick can save a massive amount of time. Alright, now all you want to do is get your sugar cane and craft it into paper. Then place three of those in the crafting grid and one of the leather in a shapeless recipe, and then you'll get a book. Then put your four obsidian down, your one book, your two diamonds, and you have your enchanting table. We don't have to bother with getting some books for this enchantment table for now, that's actually just going to waste time. But what I would suggest doing is getting out some lapis and giving a light enchantment to any of the items you have. For instance right here, by giving this pickaxe and breaking one, just that is going to basically double its durability, which is pretty awesome for basically free enchantment. Also see what you can get on your iron boots, so for instance this might have unbreaking one, but even something like knock back one on our sword could be decent. Anyway, we now have our enchanting table, and we also have our nether portal. Now it's on to the next step, nether exploration. Now before we just jump right through this nether portal, there's a couple things we want to do. The first one is make sure your spawn point is set, and then put basically all of your items in a chest. Including your armor, just go into the nether with literally nothing on you, then go through the portal once, and the point of this is basically to see what's on the other side. And it looks like in this nether it is a crimson forest, so we're going to go right back here as quickly as possible, as the crimson forest is actually a fairly dangerous dangerous nether biome, but we now know what we need. The first and most important thing is going to be some gold armor. We'll just go with golden boots because they're the cheapest, and this will protect us from piglins. And at this stage again it's always great just to see what enchantments are available. So for instance right here these golden boots are giving us feather falling too, which is obviously really nice. That's going to help us a lot when we're in the nether. So the items you need to have to safely go to the nether is a shield. You also want flint and steel. As much food as possible, I would say minimum 
minimum half a stack, but really the more the better, the reason why is that it's really hard to get more food in the nether, and you'll use it up quite a bit, as you'll often get really high damage there because of all the mobs. You don't want to have any valuables on you, so I would not suggest bringing anything made out of diamond, but once you find the nether fortress, you could bring a diamond sword. Also, a few logs can be a good idea, as there's certain items you can craft out of wood that you cannot craft out of the nether sort of wood, and bringing a few boats can definitely make you a lot safer. You also want to bring a bow and arrows, even if you don't really have very many good ones, even just a few is going to be really useful. Also, some overworld blocks, so for instance a stack of dirt, and maybe a stack of cobbled deep slate's a good idea. This will help you mark things out, which is really important. Something you may also not think of that you want is some torches. If you happen to have some apples, like I do, you might want to craft one or two golden apples, but I wouldn't suggest making too many, as you want to save most of those gold ingots for piglin trading. And I don't have much string, but if you do have string and bamboo, scaffolding is also really great. And a bit of extra iron can never be a bad thing. I'm going to bring this ender pearl as well, as it can help you sometimes get out of really bad situations. Now the first step to exploring the nether is to mark down the coordinates. So if you're in Java edition, you can just press F F3 and F2, or if you're in bedrock, make sure to turn on coordinates and then write those down somewhere, as you're definitely going to need that. Once you've written down your coordinates, you want to get your torches or maybe one of the overworld blocks, and basically start marking out an area from your portal over to wherever you want to go. So for instance, we're in this sort of crimson forest, we may as well go this way, and we're looking for one thing, and that is another fortress. Another thing you might find is a bastion, but at this stage of the game, raiding a bastion is probably not a very good good idea, so I would generally suggest just going for a nether fortress. If you're having trouble finding one, you can always use a seed finder, but what I would generally suggest is simply exploring long distances and then going back to your portal by following the coordinates that you marked down. It seems like in this world we're actually really lucky because there's a nether fortress right here next to our portal. That doesn't mean it's not a really good idea to still mark out a safe route back there, and that's because oftentimes you'll be in near-death situations when you're at the nether fortress. I would say it's the second most dangerous dangerous thing you have to do before you beat the ender dragon, and so because of that, having lots of safety precautions is always good. We're now going to equip our shield and head into the nether fortress. The best thing to do is to try and mark out where your entrance to it is, and maybe have a small trail going there, until there's a way to go multiple directions inside of the fortress, as then you'll know which way to go. There's a few specific things we're looking for here at the nether fortress, and something really important is let's say you find a tunnel that just leads nowhere, simply place a block at the start of that, it doesn't stop you from going forward. Forward, but it just says there's nothing past that area, so going this direction is a waste of time. Usually this will tend to block off most of the nether fortress, and by using this you can slowly eliminate areas that you've already been. Be careful if you run into any blazes, hold up your shield to block the fireballs, then hit the blaze, and if it's not on fire it's actually fairly safe. But also be aware for any wither skeletons that you may run into, in fact sometimes placing blocks like this, more or less right above your head, can actually be really great things to make safe areas. Just like the Enderman, this will fully stop those wither skeletons. Always check nether fortress chests and break them once you've found them, that way you will not try double looting them and just waste time. And these can actually be really common, for instance that one was just here, there's one over here that has three diamonds in it which is quite lucky, and going to the one at the end of this tunnel there's one more and that one had some gold in it. There's a few things we're looking for here, of course there are those nether loot chests, but as well as that there can be wither skeletons, you want to be careful with those. You'll also want blaze rods from the blaze and some nether wart. It looks like we just found some nether wart. Now there's basically one main area you'll find it. They can sometimes be in the nether fortress chests, but the biggest place they are are right beneath these stairs. There'll be this small crop of the nether wart. You definitely do not have to collect very many of them, but you can if you want. The only other main thing we need to get from the nether fortress at this point is the blaze rod. And I hear a lot of blaze up here, so in fact there's one right there. You want to be really careful of course with the blaze, as again they can kill you really quickly with their fireballs. These ones right here are sort of in a position where they can't really hit us, but because there are two cycles of shooting those fireballs are offset, it can be really hard to stop them effectively. Using a shield to defeat these is definitely vital. If you have a lot of arrows for your bow and arrow, you can use those to defeat the blaze, but if not I would definitely suggest saving them. And we've now killed three blazes, but there's unfortunately no blaze rods they've dropped yet. This isn't really the best place to look for them though. What we want to do is find the link between the outside part of the nether fortress and the inside part, and that's really easy. Also be careful, sometimes you'll go back to a place you'd previously explored, 
for it to be full of blazes and wither skeletons, and that's because they can spawn in where you were. For instance, there's a wither skeleton after me right now, so we're going to block it off so it cannot get to me. But I'm now going to break these blocks so I can get through, but it can't. And be really careful, these are hard to see in contrast to the nether bricks. And so because of that, one of the easiest ways of dying in the nether fortress is to be secretly hit by one of these wither skeletons. Even skeletons can occasionally spawn in the nether fortress, so it's good to be careful about those as well. If you do ever get hurt, simply hide behind a wall and regenerate your health slowly. Once it is up all the way, then you can go back and try and defeat the mobs. Now this is the part where we have to get ender pearls and blaze rods. That's because between both of them we can get eyes of ender, which will lead us to the stronghold and eventually the end dimension. Getting blaze rods at this stage of the game without looting can be quite difficult, so it's a good idea not to grab too many. All you need right now is 11 of them, 8 for the eyes of ender and 3 if you want to do brewing, so technically if you're really speedrunning you only need to grab really 8 of them. Now fighting a lot of blaze at once can be really difficult, so kind of isolating the ones they can see you at one time really makes this a lot easier. So for instance right here, we're kind of going around corners, slowly knock them down to really only one blaze that we're fighting. Either way, usually you want to go past this lava well room, and once you're there, then you can go around and basically find these blaze, as they tend to be most there on the outside portion of this. Also make sure to destroy any fire that could be underneath those blaze, as then any blaze rods that drop will simply get burnt. Make sure to always check the durability of your shield. Right here I don't have a lot of durability, so I'm going to recraft one. That's one of the reasons why I brought a bunch of wood. Now it looks like up here we found a blaze spawner, and funny enough it's covered by glowstone. This is really rare, usually what happens is this blaze spawner can spawn blaze around it, and it still can even though there is that glowstone so you want to be quite careful. However, if there's a crazy amount of light around it, then it actually will not spawn in any blaze. So just be aware that you can kind of control how many there are by how much light there is. It's just not as easy as most things. Once you have found the blaze spawner, you sort of want to block off around it, because once you've done that, then you can have safe areas and you can decide where the blaze spawn, not the other way. If you do find a blaze spawner, you're basically all set, as this is the main time-consuming thing you're going to need. So you want to go to the outer area, find this blaze spawner, and once you do, break anything around it that might be stopping them from spawning in. Be careful not to get too near the blaze either, even if they're not on fire, as they can still hit you with a really potent melee attack. Also, it's always a good idea to have little corners where you can hide from those blaze, if let's say you're on fire or are really hurt, that's definitely quite important. We now have 11 blaze rods, but I'll probably get a couple more just because I have this easy place to farm them, and rarely you will need a few more eyes of ender. So we're going to follow our torches back to the entrance, and go for the second thing, which is ender pearls. Now ender pearls used to be a lot more difficult to get, but since Minecraft 1.16, there's two more much easier ways of getting them than there ever used to be in the game. The first one is with piglin trading, which a lot of speedrunners will do, and it relies a lot on luck. But the second thing you can do is hunt endermen in the warped forest. Now we may as well do both, so I'm going to throw some of the gold ingots on the ground here, and while they sit there, I'm going to go through the portal and basically put some of our items away. The trick is, is to put any treasure you found back in the chest. So again, if you die, let's say in the nether, you're losing as few items as possible. But an important thing to do is to restock on food when you go back to that enderman hunt. And just generally restocking all your supplies between the steps is a really good idea. Though we haven't gotten very lucky with this piglin, but what we are going to do is try and find a warp forest. So we're going to mark out our path with cobblestone just because it's something that doesn't really occur naturally inside of the world. One of the reasons why you need to bring a bow and arrow in the nether is for this, and that is fighting ghasts, because it's basically the only effective way to do it. If you're in Java Edition, you can actually use boats to avoid fall damage, Simply look beneath you and make sure you're not going to land on anything bad, and you'll take no damage that way. And after exploring for a decent amount of time, we have found a warped forest. Now this is the biome where endermen spawn, and only endermen. In fact, outside of them, it's basically peaceful mode, so all you have to do is just find one of the multiple endermen that are going to be here, dig yourself a small area in the mountain, and then anger that enderman, and then you can basically hide in that area. Another method if you're in Java is to place down a boat, and then try to trap that enderman inside of the boat. They won't always get inside it, but once they do, you can simply hit them from there, 
In Bedrock, they can also go inside of boats, but the only difference is that inside of Bedrock, they can actually teleport right out of the boats, which I would say definitely makes it a very dangerous option for trying to kill Endermen. Then, for whatever reason, there was 10 Endermen I killed in a row, and none of them dropped pearls. But finally, after that, an Enderman did drop a pearl, so I just have to get two more. Now, I wasn't able to mark out very well where I was inside of the warped forest, and so because of that, I'm going to use the coordinates that I marked down of my nether portal to find the easiest way back. And I just randomly found a group of like four Endermen, so I may as well try and get some Ender Pearls from them. And finally, we made our way back to this torch trail. Now that we have all the Ender Pearls and Blaze Rods, we can start by making a brewing stand. Although we probably won't use it at this point, it's still a good thing to have. And of course, the big thing is we're going to make 16 pieces of Blaze Powder and combine them with 16 of our Ender Pearls and that'll give us 16 Eyes of Ender, which should definitely be enough to find our way all the way to the Stronghold. The Stronghold is very likely nowhere near where your temporary base is, and so because of that you want to make sure to bring any items with you that you think you might need to raid the Stronghold, but as well as defeat the dragon. So I'm going to start by harvesting the enchanting table here, as well as taking this stack of lapis. One other thing I would suggest doing is grabbing enough obsidian so that you have a total of 10 obsidian. The reason for this is that once we get to the stronghold, we can build a portal at the stronghold, which will give us an easy path that goes from the stronghold to our base. And this is super important because it can actually be somewhat difficult to travel the entire distance on foot. Then we can super easily travel between our base and the stronghold. I already have three, so I'm going to grab seven more obsidian. Before you go looking for the stronghold, you basically want to stay up one night and try and kill as many creepers as possible. The reason why is that the gunpowder for them will be super useful later on when we're raiding the end. Well, not of course being too risky, as you probably have a lot of levels at this point, it would be really bad to lose them. When you do eventually raid the end and you find your first elytra, if you already have a decent amount of fireworks with you, you actually have no need to go back to the overworld with that elytra, and then slowly wait as your pile of gunpowder gets larger and larger, and then eventually, with a large amount of rockets, you can go and raid the end. And of course, one piece of gunpowder will equal three firework rockets, and so you don't actually have to kill that many creepers to get, let's say, a stack of fireworks, which is probably a good number to go for. So maybe something like 20 pieces of gunpowder would be good. And of course, when you're fighting creepers, just always bring a shield with you, as it's really easy to block their explosions with that, so then there's not really any risk of getting hurt. And we now have 23 gunpowder, which I think is enough. So what we're now going to do is get all of our items together to go find the stronghold. There are a couple of other things we want to bring. The first one being a good supply of arrows. Now right now I only have 5 arrows, which is definitely not enough. So we're going to craft as many as we possibly can. And since we have 10 feathers, we'll try and get 10 pieces of flint from gravel. As then with that we can craft 4 arrows per piece of gravel. But 45 arrows should be enough. Ideally you could have 2 stacks, but you just need enough to be able to destroy all the end crystals. Also you want to pick a diamond weapon and then use that. I think I'm going to go with a diamond axe. Anyway, we should have just about all the items we would need to make this dragon fight easier. And so now we're going to start throwing these Eyes of Ender and see which direction they go. The best thing to do when throwing the Eyes of Ender is to go to an open place where you can see in basically every direction. Then throw the Eye of Ender and notice which direction it goes. And it looks like it went this way, but I didn't actually get to see that. But I believe it did go this way. We'll try one more time. Yeah, it looks like it went directly this way. It must have gone in the tree. And the idea is, is that basically what you want to do is you want to go the exact direction it went. Now that Eye of Ender did break, so you want to be careful, as there is a 20% chance for the Eyes of Ender to break instead of just dropping so you can grab them again. But anyway, you want to throw one Eye of Ender and basically just start traveling in the direction that it shows, and probably go that way for I would say about five to 600 blocks, as generally the stronghold will be nowhere near you. And so by traveling a long way, then you can sort of narrow down how far you have to go. Just remember the general direction it showed. For me, that was a approximately northwest, and so then I can use that as reference when I'm traveling. Another good thing to know is that because of the interesting way that the strongholds generate inside of Minecraft, basically you'll never find them right next to spawn, and so there's no point of trying to throw another pearl unless you've traveled a significant distance in the direction that it shows. But now that we've gone quite far, we'll throw an eye of Ender and see if it leads in the same direction. It does to a very similar direction, so we'll just pick up the eye of Ender there, as of course most times it'll just pop off like that instead of breaking 
morning. Another important thing you should gather during your journey is a decent amount of coal, so you can craft some torches to be able to effectively explore the stronghold. Now again, we're going to travel to a fairly high up area so we can get a good view around, and we'll throw another one of these Eyes of Ender. And it seems to still lead in this direction, so we'll just go that way until it stops going in that direction. Another really good thing to do if you can is to try and kill a bunch of animals on your way there. The reason why is that when fighting the Ender Dragon, you need a really good food source. And so by fighting a bunch of mobs that are there, their meat is always going to be better than let's say potatoes or bread. And there happens to be this village that is really nearby on our journey to the stronghold. So we may as well head here and try and get a bunch of food so that when we are fighting the Ender Dragon, we have a high saturation, which means that when we get hurt, we're going to regenerate our health really quickly. And there is a blacksmith over here and it looks like we got super lucky. There were three diamonds in this blacksmith chest. Although this is definitely not common, it is always a good idea to look in the structures that you see on your way to the stronghold. As just like that, they might have some secret items that are going to be super useful on your journey, or maybe even make your fight a lot more possible like with those diamonds. Now the last pearl we threw, we were over here and it went this direction. So if we throw a pearl right here, the direction that it shows us is going to be really useful to know. So I'll just go back a little ways, so the pearl does not hopefully go over the edge there. We're going to throw this and it seems like it's going this direction. Now this is a different direction than it went the other time and you can see right there that pearl actually broke. So if one of the lines is going this direction, and one of the lines is going this direction, wherever those two lines meet is basically where the stronghold's going to be. Now of course that doesn't tell us a massive amount, but my guess is that it's probably somewhere on that little island there, or of course you know underneath that island. So the next pearl I throw will be on there, as I'm fairly certain that those two lines will cross when they're on that island. We're now here on the island anyway, and I'm going to throw an eye of ender and see which direction it goes. It actually went this direction, which is a good sign, and although the eye of ender did break, we'll probably go over this way a bit, and throw it again, and it seems like the eye vendor actually went downwards, which means that it must be directly beneath us. So more or less, if you're within 12 blocks of the chunk where the stronghold's main staircase is, then the eye vendor will fly down. So for instance, being right here, if we throw this, you'll notice it goes this direction, which is downwards, which means somewhere right around here is where that stronghold staircase is. And because it keeps trying to fly up around here, you notice it keeps going down in this direction. So basically it's right here. So we'll mark this out real quick. And the exact place where that eye of ender travels is actually the coordinate zero zero of the chunk. And you'll notice with chunk borders on that this pillar we put down is right between them. So now we just have to find which one of these is zero zero. Also this step is not necessary at all. It just makes it so that you can dig straight down to the staircase. Of course digging down basically anywhere in this area will very likely make you mine into some part of the stronghold. So you'll notice with all these, this one is 15-0, this one is 15-15, this one is 0-15, but this one is 0-0. So this is the chunk that we've been led into. So we got that off by literally one block, which is pretty good. Now we want to go to block 4-4 of the chunk, just like this, and this will be the place that we dig down from. But anyway, we're going to start digging straight down, basically going between these two blocks. To sort of make a safe way of digging straight down, which is of course the thing that people tell you in Minecraft to never do, but in this situation it's definitely the best idea. And here is some stone bricks, and if we break this you can see yes, that's exactly what happened. But anyway, now that we're in the stronghold, how do we explore it? There are three main things we want to look for, the first one being any stronghold libraries, the second one being the stronghold portal, and the third one being any chests. What well, looks like here is the first one already, the stronghold library, that's definitely very conveniently near the place we dug down. We want to make sure to look in the chests here, as we're going to need the paper Paper, but we're going to leave any enchanted books for later. And there's always two chests, one up there and one down here in the library section. Now that we're in the stronghold library, we also want to gather string from these cobwebs. So basically break the cobwebs with a sword, because then it'll drop that string. And the point of this string is to craft scaffolding. Now you need one string per six scaffolding. And because we brought two stacks of bamboo with us, we're going to need about 20 pieces of string. And this scaffolding is incredibly vital for the first part of the ender dragon fight. So I'm going to craft all my bamboo into scaffolding, and just like with the nether fortress, the trick is basically the same. You want to go through the entire stronghold, and once you find an area that's useless, simply block that up so that you do not get fooled by it a second time. Strongholds can also be very large, so you always want to be careful when exploring them. 
this part of the stronghold here, there's always a chest that's hidden above this sort of well thing. So it's always good to look in there because there could be some useful loot. It looks like next to the staircase here that this stronghold was actually intersected by a ravine. And although I'm not sure if the portal is here or not, I can see a second library over here. And in this second stronghold library, there seems to be a bunch more paper, which I'll definitely grab as we can use that for the firework rockets. And it looks like there's a massive additional section to the stronghold that I didn't even realize was here and this often happens with stronghold exploration because it's just so large it's really common to find whole areas that you didn't even realize existed and we can see there's sort of just some tunnels that go around here i do hear some lava we may as well mine through here oh it looks like it actually is the stronghold that's through here which is pretty cool i'm not sure this links into everything else or why we weren't able to find it before but hopefully now that we know where it is we can find the way back and it looks like what it was is basically directly through here so from that ravine we just go right through here into this iron door and there is the main stronghold stronghold portal. The first step is always to break the silverfish spawner as there's just really never a good reason to have it there. And I would actually always suggest doing that when you find the stronghold portal is to set up a temporary base there. And you'll want to get any raw meat you have in your inventory smelting if you were grabbing it for the ender dragon fight. Now we're going to grab our diamond sticks, enchanting table and lapis, and we're going to enchant our items. Now with 10 diamonds the only thing we can use that has almost all of them is boots as well as a helmet. Which should actually be good because both these items are fairly useful. Although of course we could make leggings, we just wouldn't have enough for everything else. And now with how many ever levels you have, lapis and enchanting table, you want to go back to one of those stronghold libraries and enchant your items there. Now the idea would be we'll basically find an area where the enchanting table would be next to a massive amount of bookshelves at the same time. And now the enchanting table goes up to level 30. Now let's check what the enchantments are. The boots have feather falling 4, which is literally perfect, but we do not have 30 levels, so if we put a torch here to block it off a bit. That's not level 26. Let's try placing the torch in a different area. Now it's at 28, but it still says feather falling 4, so we're going to enchant that as that's going to increase our chance of survival by a massive percentage in both the Ender Dragon fight as well as the End City. And we also got a bunch of other great stuff on there, so that was definitely really good. And let's see what the helmet has. It has blast protection 4, which isn't really perfect. We could see what's on the sword. And the sword could have unbreaking 3. The bow could also have unbreaking 3. I think we'll give the sword unbreaking 3 and see if we get anything else with it. And it also is looting too, which is actually additionally very, very good, because when we're fighting the Shulkers, that's going to give us more of their shells. We're technically at 23 levels, so I think I'll just enchant a random item to take it down a level. And at level 21, we have either power 2, or on the helmet, we have respiration 2. Well, I think power 2, although not amazing, is definitely decent and will help us a bit. We also got Unbreaking 2, and we can get Protection 2 on our helmet, so we'll do that. Then with the rest of our Iron Armor, we'll just enchant it with the highest level enchantment we can get. And the point of the torches, as it basically blocks them from powering this. So now that we've enchanted all of our items, we're going to return back here and get the full list of everything we need to bring. Also right next to the end portal here, we're just going to throw up another portal, light it, go through, and later on we can use this to travel back a lot easier. So the first step is to make sure a spawn point is set right next to the end portal, so if you do die, you can come back. Then you want Eyes of Ender, you want Ender Pearls. We'll leave Ender Eating Supplies here for now. If you can get it, a Golden Apple can be super useful. You also want the best armor you can possibly get, as much of your tool set as you have. You also want a decent amount of cobblestone or some other easy building block. And make sure it's one that Endermen cannot pick up. Some wood is always good. And a shield to block against Endermen. Also, one really important thing to bring I do not have here is glass bottles. In fact, I would suggest having about three stacks of glass bottles, if not more. I mean, really as many as you can possibly get, because when you're fighting the Ender Dragon, you can collect the Dragon's Breath with those, which will save time later from having to respawn the Ender Dragon, and then collect it from there. But other than that, we have all the items we need. So now for the big moment, we're going to light up the End Portal, go through it, and defeat the Ender Dragon. And here we are in the end. Now there's a couple of different places that you can spawn in on top of that obsidian pillar. Either you're inside of the rock or you're outside of it. And so if you are inside, make sure to dig a staircase upwards. But if you're not, that's why it's good to have the ender pearls and building blocks, as sometimes there's actually no easy way of getting out, because it'll be all the way out in the void and you can just see the end island from somewhat of a distance. Anyway, here we are at the ender dragon battle and there it is. Of all the towers that have the end crystals on them, two of them have cages on top. 
So we want to make sure to destroy all the end crystals because that's how the ender dragon regenerates. So you basically want to hit those from a distance, but you want to be careful as of course if you hit them incorrectly and lose too many arrows, then you will not have a safe way of getting them anymore. And the ender dragon will sometimes throw the dragon's breath at you and that's really dangerous so it's good to be careful of that. But anyway, you want to start by going around and hitting all the end crystals that you can reach without having to pile up or break the iron bars. Also of course being incredibly careful to avoid eye contact with any of the endermen. There's not really any more easy to hit end crystal towers left, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a scaffolding that goes all the way up here, and then from there we can hit them. But we're going to be careful because the ender dragon can sometimes fly right next to us, like it is right now. And if it does hit the scaffolding, the scaffolding will break, and then of course we'll fall to our death. And so something really important is at the base of the place where we can fall, to place down a water bucket so that we can safely go up here, and if we do fall down and could possibly die, then from here we'll be safe because we can land in the water. Now once we're up here, we want to hit that end crystal, but of course watching the location of the ender dragon, as it is now flying really close to us, and it looks like I've angered an enderman. Now if you've ever done this, something to do is to place down a water bucket, then there's this water around you that you can be protected from, and so from that water then you can hit these endermen safely. The only issue of course is that sometimes the ender dragon will fire its dragon's breath at you, so then what you have to do is you have to run, place down that water bucket again, go to the center of the water bucket, and from there yet again you can basically go, and you can try and find a place to avoid it from. And now that we've dealt with that angry enderman, we can continue on with the fight in relative safety. Something that's often a good idea is to go fairly far away from the center of the area, and to place down a water bucket, and to make your scaffolding from there, because then the chance of the ender dragon breaking it is super low. Although it seems like all the crystals over here have been destroyed, oftentimes from a vantage point like that, then you can be fairly safe to try and destroy them. But the ender dragon will almost always try and fly in your direction like it did right there, as soon as it's done being on the pedestal, so that's the most important time to look out. And there's one more of the end crystals gone, now there's very few of these that are left for us to need to destroy. We have to be careful because the dragon can go really directly at us, so we have to get a little bit lower here, as you saw even then the ender dragon hit us, so if we're even higher we'd probably be dead. Always make sure to grab your water, it's definitely your most important resource. Now once you're at this stage and it's hard to see which one of the towers are left, just see which one the ender dragon has that beam from, and so from there then we can just go up and hit that one. And so yet again we can pile up here and destroy that end crystal, and you can see from up here all the crystals but that one over there are gone. We can probably actually hit that crystal, but we have to be careful as there's a big chance that the dragon could destroy the scaffolding, and there's that crystal gone you can see. So now that we're at that stage of the fight, we can basically now fall down into any of the water here, destroy the bottom piece and pick up our water, and let all that scaffolding go everywhere. Unless there's one crystal left that I haven't noticed, we're now at the stage of the fight where we need to hit the dragon. Now when the dragon is swirling down to land, this is a really good time to hit it, because that's the best time. Now if I turn on hitboxes, you'll notice here, near the dragon's head, there's this box. If we can hit it in that boxer, that's when it's going to get damaged the most. So sometimes a good idea is to wait for it to fly away, and the second that it starts to fly away, which it'll probably do in just a minute here, then we can probably hit it with some arrows. So more or less hit the ender dragon with as many arrows as you possibly can, more or less until you run out of them, especially trying to aim for its head if you can. I would say the best time to hit it is when it's swirling down like this, it's definitely the easiest point to hit it. And you want to go below it and start hitting the dragon with your sword. Just be really careful because can throw you into the air, so if you throw an ender pearl and it lands, that's what can save you. As what I did right there, throwing that ender pearl saved me, but still that's why the ender pearls are so important to have. And we are now unfortunately out of arrows, so we can only hit it with our sword. Now that it's down here, we can try and hit it as much as possible, so we're going to go underneath it and hit it just like this. Trying to jump up and hit it on the way down is always the best idea. Of course if you have a sharpness sword or something like that, it can often be a lot better. You just have to be really careful, as of course when that ender dragon flies away, you can get flung up into the air like I was just there, although I did throw the ender pearl right then, you still have to be really careful. But now the dragon is at half health, so it shouldn't be that difficult to go underneath it, and basically start hitting it. But again, you just have to be super careful with this, and it'll probably throw you into the air. But just having those ender pearls ready, it's fairly easy, and you can notice here we're getting a massive amount of damage taken off of the ender dragon. And here comes the ender dragon down one more time, so we're just going to go beneath it and try and hit it as much as possible. If we do try and hit it in the head, the damage can be way more, but we can also get thrown up in the air like that, so you have to be super careful. But with only a fifth of its HP left, we should be able to kill it as soon as it goes back down. We may as well eat our golden apple for this. 
go back down here and see if we can finish off the dragon as soon as possible as it's getting super low and basically one more hit and we'll be able to get it. It just flung us up into the air again. So literally we just have to go down here, hit the Ender Dragon once, and the Ender Dragon is now defeated. And there we go, free the end. So for a lot of people they count this as the end of Minecraft, but there's a lot more to it. And this is such an amazing end sequence. We can see the dragon explodes there. We have this awesome beam that goes up into the sky over there. And now we have a massive amount of levels. Now this is one of the only places in the game to get these insanely large XP orbs. And combined all together, you can get an absolutely insane amount of levels. And one quick thing not to forget is to simply grab a torch here, right click on the dragon egg, then look at where it appeared, dig under it one block, place a torch, break the block here, have the ender dragon egg fall down. And now before we go through the end gateway over there and raid the end cities, we're just going to jump through here. You could always take a look at the credits if you want, although they are quite long. And then once you've done that, you'll teleport back to your spawn point for us that was right next to the end portal here. And now for the final goal in the main sequence of events in Minecraft, and that is the end city. So for the end city, we need similar things to the ender dragon fight, but also as many fireworks as possible, as many wood items as possible. Some scaffolding is really important, water buckets are necessary, as well as as much food as you can possibly get. Something you also want to craft is a trapdoor, where you can use an ender pearl if you're in bedrock edition. And I would almost always suggest waiting to loot the end until you have a looting two or three sword, and because we did actually very luckily get a looting two sword, it's perfect. You also want to have as many building blocks as you can possibly get your hands on, and that's for bridging across the end. That's just about all you need, so we're going to go through here and get ourselves some elytra. We can basically go over to the first one of these portals that open up. Now technically, every single time you defeat the Ender Dragon, a new portal will open up, so it's up to you how many of those you want, and they all go to different areas. And once you're up here, put down a trap door, flip it down so that you're in crawl mode, or if you're in bedrock, just throw an ender pearl into there, and whatever method you do, you'll go through here, and you've now been teleported to the other end, and you can see there's this sort of strange beacon beam here, and we are now at the remote getaway. Now we actually got fairly lucky here, because you can see there's two end cities very, very close in radius, and this one seems to have an end ship, but if there's not, you basically just have to super slowly go between here. We do have one problem though, and that's the fact that we're incredibly far away from the edge of anything, so though we could throw an ender pearl at this distance it's way too risky. So what we're going to do, even though it's a bit nerve-wracking, is we're going to bridge out across here with the end stone. And we're also going to have handy on our inventory and ender pearl, just in case we do end up falling down, we'll at least have a chance to go back up. The first thing you have to know that's really important is that if you have an end city that's super nearby, or really whatever your closest end city is, make sure to save those two shulkers that are right at the entrance, because they're really important if you want to make yourself a shulker farm later on. Also, just chop down a couple chorus plants and get yourself about a stack of chorus fruit. And I'll tell you the reason for this later. Now you want to equip your shield and head over to the end city, and try using the shield to avoid getting hit with these shulker pellets. Although another good trick to try is to basically hide underneath something. The point of the chorus fruit is it teleports you to the ground, and so because of that if you feel like you're flying away, you can actually use that to safely land. Now unfortunately in Java Edition, even with looting, getting these shulker shells is fairly difficult, but in Bedrock it is a bit easier, especially if you do have looting. And also when you're hitting those shulkers, if they're open, they'll actually take a lot more damage. Placing down a water bucket is often a really good idea, because not only is it a really good way of traversing through here, it'll also make it so that if you let's say have the levitation effect, you can still go up and down as the effect does not apply inside of water. The things you want to be looking out for when raiding the end city are the end rods if you like to decorate with them, although they can be crafted with pop chorus fruits and blaze rods. You also of course want to kill every single shulker you see, as the shulker shells are really only second to elytra in terms of how valuable they are. And the third thing you want to be looking out for is the loot chests that are around. There's also the ender chests and anything you put in here, like let's say these shulker shells, will stay in there forever even if you die, or of course you can take them out, but it's like a transport chest. And also within the loot chests here, there's all kinds of great stuff like gold, emeralds, iron, and also diamond armor and tools. So you can generally use these to upgrade yourself from a mix of iron to pure diamond. Now sometimes there are these massive shulker rooms, and these are the most dangerous rooms in the entire end city. You want to be really careful with these, as it's incredibly easy to die, and also the shulkers tend to teleport away quite a bit. And so I would suggest really hiding into a corner, so that the shulkers can't make you go any higher up 
then try and kill all the shulkers at the bottom first by basically just staying in the corner. But make sure to use your shield a lot and eat a lot of high saturation foods as these shulkers can be very deadly. And I would actually suggest breaking these chests also so that later on when you're trying to get some shulker boxes you can craft them out of these chests. We now have the levitation effect and are flying over to the end ship here and we're just going to use an ender pearl there to safely get here. There's actually a brewing stand that spawns in, and this is where the two other main pieces of loot in the end city are. Not all end cities have these end ships, but if they do, this is where the best stuff is. The first one is of course the elytra, which is the most important thing, and eventually you want to try and get mending and unbreaking on there, because once you do, you then have unlimited flight inside of Minecraft. There's also two shulkers that spawn here. The second piece of loot though on the end ship that everyone forgets about is the dragon head, so be sure to go over here and grab the dragon head, as this is the only place to get this super rare and valuable item inside of the entire game. And funny enough, you can actually wear this on your head and it'll open and close, and if there's redstone behind it, it'll do that as well. But now that you have the elytra, once you've raided the first end city, grab those firework rockets that you had before, and the first thing you actually want to do if you haven't already is travel back to where that end gateway is, and make sure to mark down the coordinates of it, as you definitely do not want to lose it. So I'll mark down these, it's just about 0, negative 1000, which is quite easy. Then you want to fly in a straight line trying to find the next end city, and it's good to try and go as efficiently as possible, as of course your elytra durability will soon run out, but the good news is, is that generally what you can do is you can craft all the shulker shells you find into more shulker boxes, then you can place all the loot you find in those shulker boxes, and if you happen to have a pair of elytra that run out of durability, all you have to do is just grab the elytra from the next end ship, like let's say the end ship on this end city we're coming to right now, and of course also make sure to grab that dragon head, grab it along with all the loot that's in this chest of course, and then once your elytra durability is really low, you can just switch it out for the new one, and save your old elytra in one of your storage shulker boxes, so the only thing that can limit this permanent end raid is if you run out of food or rockets, and if you brought a lot of both then you can get yourself a massive amount of all these great items, and go back to the overworld with elytra, diamond armor, shulker boxes, diamond tools, treasures, dragon heads, and so much more. Even straight up diamonds can be in the loot chests here, and it ends up being really quick. And so there we have it, full diamond armor, three pairs of elytra, and really as much more as we want, and of course all you have to do to head back is go through one of those end gateways, then go through the main portal and you're done. So that's the guide to survival in Minecraft. I am going to have more guides like this going through mid game, late game, and hopefully discussing the entire Minecraft world in general. I really hope this massive guide helped you and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye!